Um, okay, I'm going to talk to you about disruptive technologies and legal issues. Um, that's my quote for the day. Anybody in the UK fan in the audience? Um, no, I'm not there. You should be. It's absolutely great. Um, people I, I start to get that sense as we move through our fourth industrial revolution that people are being, the ones are being left out and not really satisfactory. Um, and we should be doing away with them. Um, and uh, that's an interesting point. <coughs> reasons. Is this to save cost? Is it to remove inefficiency? Or is it to question personal judgment that is either inaccurate or in bad faith? It's balanced. And I would say all of those things are dimensions that we need to address in this chaotic construction industry in which we work. <coughs> um, but we need to be testing. I think the, as with every aspect of disruptive technology, Blockchain and smart contracts get very excited. It's like Bill has got us very excited. Any aspect of AI and machine learning gets us very excited. Um, I think we can keep excited. I'm not going to you know, chuck a bucket of cold water over it, but I think we need to be analytical. I live in a world of, of today's projects um, and today's clients and contractors. We were discussing earlier the fact that, forgive me, say this, UCL like Kings. State's Department favour a single stage design to build a contract, uh, despite the fact that people like Adam and me floating around uh, telling them to remodel one of the more sophisticated models in the world. Um, we have a uh, government, uh, the last government, particularly the coalition, set up a fantastic construction strategy. We have Paul Morell and um, his successor uh, yesterday um, looking at um, you know, the implementation of those government construction strategies, looking at the intelligent timber models, still people slide back to a prehistoric Neanderthal procurement system. And when we talk about a digital future, we have to remember that it's quite bizarre what products and the industry seem to prefer. I don't, I don't get it. I really, really don't understand why that is. I'd like someone to tell me where this insidious message is coming from. That there is security in chucking a load of risk over the wall and watching it come back in the shape of clones and litigation. Uh, but, but that's our stuff. Um, I will answer this point, basic point, it doesn't really take us anywhere, whether smart contracts create new legal relationships or implement existing ones. Not a big point, but uh, it's a where we start point. Um, but the real point I want to look at is the way I see contracting for BIM, it really does complement that. Is, presentation, uh, coming down from the top of the supply chain, and that's where procurement comes from. It starts with clients, it starts with clients engaging consultants and contractors. And I see smart contracts as this liberation of the supply chain in a way that project bank accounts and fair payment charters and all these other attempts of support failed to help, uh, coming up from the bottom. Uh, the simpler the transaction, the more obvious it is that you can run a smart contract for it. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the meeting point between those two, I see, two different types of contract and two different initiatives. And I think that, I hope, will help you to vote uh, without taking anything away from uh, the momentum of it. We have the McKinsey report this year, actually fascinating, talking about the need to rewire the contractual framework. That is music to my ears. That's what I need to, to try to do. It's brilliant. You know, I was for 30 odd years in private practice where I liked doing that. I had to make a lot of money and keep a lot of people happy. It's great in academia. You yeah. so can interfere um, and get paid a salary um, and help to try to implement and put into practice uh, through connections to the industry. So, um, the yin and yang, because I looked it up, and it's, it's, it's light and dark, masculine and feminine, and positive and negative. So, then, Anyone who's offended by the use of the term yin and yang, uh, please don't be. I'm just talking about two aspects that fit together. And I think collaborative interactions and disruptive technology are, to my mind, the yin and yang of successful projects. And we need to test, as I say, how they relate to each other. Um, we, did a, we did a report this time last year. I think one of the problems I have with both procurement reform and the advance of Technology is that last year, oh, that was last year, that's not counting all that stuff again. Getting quite frustrated by that. 
uh, some of us have seen many initiatives. So I still go back to Sir Michael Latham, 1994, uh, before we even had proper computers, when you read his report, it's not even in a consistent typeface. And he went around and had 120 meetings with real people over a year, and he produced a seminal report that is as influential today as it was then. Um, and we shouldn't forget it, nor should we forget, as I said, the 2011 government construction strategy and the models that have been put in place that are a good deal more effective than people think and certainly cut through the vagueness that used to attend talk about collaborative work. Um, Mark View uh, wrote an introduction to our report, which will be enabling them through procurement of contracts, and May uh, and Daria both uh, worked on it. Um, and he looked at this report and he said, yep, that's a fascinating cross-sectional view of the current market state. We don't try to predict the future, we were assessing how people adopted the L2. And he recognised that L2 does not change the contractual relationship. There's a lot of chat about that. We were pretty rude about the CIC protocol. I'm still pretty rude about it in a very constructive way. I think one can do better, a lot better. Um, and it one needs to do it. Um, but there are other interesting things that did do to the contractual relationship, not adding a bunch of clauses to current standard form contracts, but demanding the rewiring of the whole approach. Uh, that is wonderful for me. That is to get that thing done. It's not optional extra, not some fancy thing you do on the side before going back to the good old traditional DMP. This is the reasons that Hallow and Malachi rehearsed. Uh, an essential, but it's not only a smart contract, we'll look at both sides of it. Um, what Mark said was that the use of accurate data deliverables places a sharp focus on performance of traditional working methods that should have been addressed many years ago. And uh, let me say a reasonable period of time or a reasonable judgment. Neither of those mean a thing. They're a complete cop out for a subjective assessment that largely leads to the forgetting. And yet they run through our contracts, and our assessments, like, you know, brighten through a stick of the rock. Um, we need to do better, we need to look at new solutions. We, um, I, you know, I really hope, has anybody seen that report? Please, please look, yeah, it's, it's online, it's free, do download it. It reverses things uh, by reference to 40 interviews, 12 case studies, um, and I, I believe that uh, it offers good. Uh, starting point for an assessment of where we go next by sorting a number of issues that people are still blabbering on about as if they haven't been looked at. Um, uh, one of the things we came up with um, was this notion of, of creating direct relationships between project team members so we don't depend on intermediaries. The client is an intermediary for all of the tier one appointments, the manufacturer is an intermediary for every engagement. With a specialist manufacturer or subcontractor, that is chronic, clunky inefficiency. And the idea that the sky would pay in if people were in direct arrangements with each other has just not proven to be true. 17 years ago, I wrote a standard form called PPC 2000. Who has heard of that? Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, that was a, ahead of its time, I'm told. Multi party contract, early contractor involvement, early specialist involvement. Uh, it was doing so well. 6% of the entire UK market, and then the recession came along, the big one, and everybody went back to simple stage <coughs> because people who did so low, and did suicidally low, let's have some of that. And it's nothing short of a miracle that the government said, hang on a minute, we remember how many insolvents there were, let's have a slightly more intelligent investigation of knowledge and power and control and move towards integration. So I'm delighted to say PPC was used on the municipal news and all the Ministry of Justice projects, their exemplar vision projects, the trial projects, are uh, PPC. This isn't about the PPC. Big mistake I made. The energy I wasted in promoting, I don't get word to this contract, but it, I always miss the boat on uh, Promoting that, putting all that energy into it, is that it's one project. And it's one plan. So uniting a team and integrating their work for a single project isn't where the story is. The story is in strategy. People are procuring a single project, however big. It's of limited value to the world, particularly if they're not integrating the operational maintenance of 
The story is in where do you start with procurement, what connections are made to the design, capital and operational phases of a project, what connections are made from one project to another. If you're talking about the libraries, if you're talking about a system, if you're talking about modular, just in a factory and build some houses project, you can't do one project at a time and shut the factory down in between. It's completely non starter I've done that twice. I did it with Amphia and I've done it with the National Change Agency program. We have to think strategically. Um, so this notion, um, I've given you a reference. I thought, can I get through this talk without mentioning the standard report that King was produced last year? It looks like I can't. Um, the FAC one form framework reliance contract is something you can investigate on that on that website. Um, and it seeks in an agnostic way as regards to the JCTs, the NECs, the PPCs, the PIDICs, the bespoke, completely agnostic way to rewire contracts on a strategic basis to address all of those things that we've been reading while I've been speaking. Um, so I'm not going to talk today about contracting for BIM. I see BIM as, I mean, Malachi is so right, it is disappointing that people haven't caught the bug in terms of value sufficiently for it to be normalised. We're still promoting it vigorously. I'm fascinated by everything you said in terms of coming with this and other angles. But it doesn't mean we throw away the reality that procurements come from clients, by our consultants and manufacturers, and that there's an integration job to do there, as well as a sort of rationalisation of supply chain dealings. Um, so I'll come back to that. I will give you a new term today, copyright and diagnosis, an enterprise contract. That is the term I want to use uh, to get it away from a standard form, and I'll tell you what that is in the context of contract theory later on. Um, if you say that it first, you make me a happy, happy old man. Um, okay, we know what a smart contract is. I hope most people in the room do. Um, but it's that point, it's addressing, quite a bit, I suppose, was addressing this, this point that was made by reason that. that um, if, as we, the point has been reached in the development of technology where the greatest danger step from the insidious accumulation of delayed action human failures, which emerge from a complex and complex and as yet little understood interaction between technical and social aspects of the system. We've got a lot of interactions. We cannot take people totally out of the equation. It, they, everything starts with people. The people have to design robots that design factory. You know, people have to program the software. It's not blame free, no, but a different way. It's not free from responsibility. And we need always to keep that in mind. This is not a get out of jail free card, either in terms of efficiency and safety of the building, or in terms of the computers uh, taking everything and doing it for us. Um, we know what a smart contract is, I'm not even going to reverse that. Um, but it is interesting that we were talking there about common contractual conditions and the minimization of the need for trusted intermediaries. We, we've got this fantastic system, and, and most people in the room know more about it than me, um, to stop these blockages in the supply chain. But can I just remind you why they occur? Um, uh, in, there was a day when people got interest on money in the bank, I know it doesn't happen anymore, um, and contractors would make a lot of money out of sitting on, a, a lot of interest out of sitting on money. Everybody likes to sit on money. So it's not only inefficiency, it's also bad faith that keeps us sitting on payments and delaying them. So don't think everyone's going to say, oh, that's efficient. Yeah, give us that. If it takes away uh, the control over making a decision, people love power. Uh, what else they got? You know, they've got a hell of a lot of risk in the construction industry. You know, you take the power away, they're, they're pretty direct. Um, and they've got, you know, greed. You know, the, the, the motivations, um, it's not always knowledge, some of it is desire, and some of it is emotion as well. I'm not going to give you a bloody money until you do this complete that reason to think I've asked for, because I can do that, is a practice. So we have human beings who ain't no good, um, whom we need to address, and who are yeah, maybe good, but they may not be ideal. Um, so we've got an issue there that is an implementation issue. We know, we know smart contracts and blockchain can deliver something remarkable. Uh, we can't ignore the context in which it's delivered. We also need to pick this up, and I know May um, is, uh, wrote, wrote to me about this case this week, and other people have written to me about it, because um, it's a different case. This year, it will be wrecked people, 
behaving in an arguably disreputable way on a great project. So there was a payment dispute, and Mott was the political coordinator of remote access codes to the foundation environment, and therefore threatened to bring the project to a standstill. And Trump had to go to court to get an interim injunction to override that participation. And that's good. And that is because you've got a gatekeeper in control of access to the data, a person making decisions that might be quite self serving um, around who can access the data and when. It's not only an efficiency, that's commercial leverage. Um, now, I'm not going to talk in detail about how blockchain works better, I will leave that conversation to roll around later on. But my understanding is that it is more autonomous than BIM because it's designed to be decentralized, it's not in the hands of one controlling party, it is decentralized but subject to a set of common rules. It is immutable once we've got blocks of data that have been validated and written, the whole hash code point, you know, you see if someone's tinkered with it, uh, you have a commitment that they won't and it's cryptographically secure. Um, uh, so you could say that we don't have to worry about access to the data through uh, blockchain <laughs> in the way that we still, frankly, have to worry about it uh, in relation to BIP. If those conditions, if their decentralization and immutability and that security are for real, and we can perhaps discuss later whether that's the case. Um, Right, enterprise contracts, here we go. Um, we, we get, we're getting closer to the nub of this. You know, to set up a smart contract, you need, a con to my mind, tell me if I'm wrong later, a conventional contract map. You need offer and acceptance and intent. It's an essential arrangement. Um, so the self, in, when, when people say self-executing, you always get very confused. Because once executing the contract is signing, um, self-implementing, what we're talking about. So smart contracts are self-implementing. They're ways of complying with exchange obligations as delivery payment. But you've got to set up a contract within which that functions. People talk about micro-contracts. Those are micro-transactions that are not stopped, messed around with, subject to arbitrary decisions. I get that. But the system has to be set up. And it's set up, of course, through programming software. Um, and so here's a case. Um, uh, that I get up from Jim Mason, who's doing some good work in this, in this field in the University of Western England. The fact that acceptance was automatically generated by computer software cannot in any manner exonerate the defendant from responsibility because the defendant programmed the software. The programmer of the software is very important. Uh, I, I get a bit ratty about this. Um, I get ratty about the CRC protocol because of various cop-outs um, around normal levels of responsibility, but also around the responsibility of the people who program the software, who are responsible for not much. And if you read your software licenses, um, the, exactly. there's not a lot of response to the fact doesn't really stop with the software provider or programmer. So, you know, we need, I think, to address that. I do, I would like to see with a combined efforts of the people in this room, something, you know, like King Kong versus Godzilla, the, you know, the software industry and the construction industry, who clearly have a mutual dependence, mapping out the concept of liability and responsibility that is sustainable. But the usual exclusions that we all sign up to because we really, really want a new laptop um, are not reconcilable with the liability that uh, comes with uh, building for um, that's, you know, those exclusions don't, don't probably. So check the small print and have a think about it is, is my piece of advice for the day. Um, right, enterprise contracts explained. Classical contract, buy a pen, pay for it, job done. Buy a load of bricks, pay for it, get them delivered to site, job done. A number of supply contracts fulfill that uh, classification. I appreciate quite a lot, but it doesn't really matter. Most construction contracts are classified as neoclassical, as in you try to be as complete as you can with the transaction, but stuff changes. Progress is variable, payment is variable, changes have to be dealt with, unforeseeable events have to be dealt with. We're dealing with future contingencies because we have to, not because we want to, if you like. Change, I suppose, is voluntary, but you get the, the picture. For a long time, 
uh, people refer to collaborative construction contracts as relation. And Alan's point about the failure of farmering initiatives, I, I would debate, we'll have a debate another day because I can point to a lot of successes, but the argument benefit, but the underlying sense to me comes back to contract theory. The people confuse partnering and collaboration with a relational contract. A relational contract to me is Malachi and I are going to go into a partnership together or a joint venture. We're going to look to the horizon and we're going to conquer the world. We don't know what we're going to encounter, but we're going to do it together. That's no good on a building project. Building project, you have to be working towards certainty. You have to be working towards certainty. Brief, cost, time, standards, and get from A to B. A relational contract falls into the trap of partnering that you don't need clarity. Because we're getting on so well. A dreadful, dreadful error and, and, and myth that has held back intelligent collaborative working for many years. Um, so here's my here's my defined term. We've only been using it in a, in a few articles this year. Um, but where is where is it coming from? It's this notion of a contract that by a series of interactions builds up agreed data. Think about a consultant appointment. A consultant appointment, when the architect's appointed, <coughs> you've got hardly any data at all. As you approve their designs, that data becomes the basis for the next stage of their appointment. Bring a contractor in, and you've got this notion of building up data amongst a team sufficient to be ready to start on site. Um, then it becomes the expanded chain, the enabler for that sort of arrangement. But those are interactions between multiple parties um, that are not little micro classical contracts. They are the build up uh, in elements and in stages, programmed, not optional, of the full picture you need. And it's a McNeil concept. Ian McNeil, um, the title to be the Hiking of Ireland, uh, there was one. Uh, this is a McNeil plan. American economist, absolutely brilliant. Um, and he talked about enterprise planning to get away from negotiation. All of our engagements before we have a contract seem to be negotiation. That is adversarial and competitive. Joint activities are not. Like I'm really taking part in my class, so I'll be very quick and let Zaria have her go. But I think that if we're going to connect smart contracts to an intelligent headline set of arrangements, we don't connect them to traditional contracts. We don't connect them to anything that looks like traditional contracts. We need a rewiring of the other relationships to be ready for smart contracts and the other situation. <coughs> um, they can self implement once we've got the uh, program software, recognizing the read activities, identify activities. Um, I would suggest they'll struggle to self implement non binary enterprise activities, I'm not saying anybody is suggesting that, but let's make the point in case we think they're going to sweep all contractual arrangements into the gutter. Um, if we have, if we recognise in the modern world that we're not just piling up tender documents, whacking them out, getting a price back, and then oppressing people into the level of clarity you get through smart contracts, but that we're recognising the benign effect of creative and innovative human Activity as a as an enduring element, people can be good. They're not always net paid to describe them. Then we need to cater for design, development, and innovation, for the balancing of economic and social value, for the agreement of change, for the running of an early warning and joint risk management. I don't. I just want. I don't want a load of evidence for litigation. I've never done litigation in my life. I had 35 years in private practice. Never did a court case. We did contracts. We did procurement. We contracted for success, not failure. Um, so I want to build up an evidence, I don't only want to build up an evidence base. I want to have a system between people that gets them in the same room with the shared data in front of them so they can knock something on the head and it doesn't fester. Um, so I want to see the rewiring of contracts in a way that embraces uh, what this consortium is working on, um, that recognises the huge power of it. I love the idea of the crypto. Currency is where you get something new from every session. Um, and that harnesses collaborative human interactions with digital efficiency through disruptive technology so that the uh, legal and contractual meeting points are defined between the enterprise contracts and the smart contracts. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.